Hi hey guys, welcome back. This is Professor Hank, and in this video we are going to have a brief introduction on polymorphism in Python. And we're going to talk about what it is, we're going to talk about what method overriding is, and we're going to talk about the use for the is instance function. So let's begin. What is polymorphism? Well, polymorphism allows for a subclass to have methods that share the same name as methods in their superclass. So you can have two separate classes. You can have one that's a parent, one that's a child, and they both have a method named spam. Right? Now, both methods might do two completely different things, but they have the same name. Now, polymorphism allows a program to call the correct method, right? to call a specific method, based off of the type of the object used to call it. Okay, So if I use, or if I have an instance of the parent class, and I call that spam method, then I'm going to have, using an object that is an instance of that, that parent class, then it's going to be the parent class's method that gets invoked. Right? If I use an instance of the child class, if I use that object to call the method, then it's going to be the child class's version that gets invoked. Right? So method overriding is what you call it when you have a child class that has a method with the same name as the parent class. The isInstance function allows you to determine if a particular object is an instance of a particular class. This could be useful if you want to make sure that the class you're, in, you're trying to invoke a method on is actually the class. So before I invoke my spam method, I might want to make sure that that object is actually an instance of a class that has a spam method. All right, so let's explore these ideas through a sample program. All right, so I will define a superclass, which I will call shape. Okay, and I'll define a initialized report, which is simply going to accept a single argument and use that argument to initialize a hidden variable called x. We'll have an accessor and a mutator called get x, which is simply going to return the hidden attribute and set x, which is simply going to update that hidden attribute. Okay, and then I will create a nonsensical get area method. Right? And for this method, I will return just zero, right? Because what's the area of a shape? I, I, I don't know, it's, it's a shape. It's not, you know, I don't have enough information. So I'll just have it return zero. Now that get area method, we're going to override that in our child classes or in our subclasses. Okay, let me define a main function for our main line logic. And let's instantiate um, a shape object. Okay, so shape, and I'll initialize it to three. And then we'll invoke its get area method. And we'll just print out what it returns just for testing purposes. Okay, so there's the zero that gets returned, fine. All right, so now let's create a subclass that inherits from class shape. And we'll call that class square. Okay, and we'll have an initializer method for it as well. All right, and that's, this is going to be our first example of method overriding because we've got two different classes, right? And they have the same name. The child class is the same name as its parent class. Okay. Uh, let's see here. So we'll just have the child class's initializer method invoke its parents. So that way the parent method will, um, oops, that should be shape, sorry. The parent method initializer method will initialize that hidden attribute underscore underscore x 
And you want to do that because we don't want to accidentally bypass any, you know, maybe input validation code that might have been in the parent class's initializer, right? So, you know, don't, it's a good idea not to directly access inherited uh, variables. You know, if they provide methods for interacting with them, use those. Okay, so let's then uh, add an, uh, another method here. We're going to add an overridden get array method. Now, we don't have to rewrite get exercise because we inherited those. So what we're going to do is, is we're going to override the inherited get area method, right? So because we, we know what a square is, and so we know how to compute the area of a square. So we'll return you know, by calling the getx method we inherited. We'll return the square of the value that that returns. Okay, so I've got in my class square a get area method definition that I just added, but I also inherited a get area method. Okay, so which one is it going to use? Which method is going to get invoked or get executed if I create a square object? In which I'll initialize the two. Now, if I call that square.getArea, which get area is going to get executed? Okay, so this is where the polymorphism comes in because the program will be able to look at what type of object is invoking the get area. So SQ, that variable, is a reference to a square object. Therefore, it's going to be the square classes get area method that gets invoked and not the shapes get area method that square had inherited. Okay, so we'll go ahead and print that out to show you what that looks like. Okay, so there's your four, right? That's the second print. So what did we initialize square with? Two. And so what did we return? Like invoking the, the squares get area method two squared. Let's add yet another subclass of shape. We'll call this one rectangle and it is a shape also. And we'll go ahead and define its own initializer. Right? And this time it's gonna accept two arguments because since it's a rectangle, it's got that length and width. So um, it's going to have X to represent one of those dimensions and Y to represent the other. So we'll go ahead and invoke the parent class initializer like we did before for square. But then we're gonna need to create a new hidden attribute underscore underscore Y that will initialize with the second argument. So that'll give us our X and Y, our length and our width. Now I'm gonna to have to add a couple of more methods here. I'm gonna to have to add an accessor and a mutator. So we'll add the uh, get Y, okay, which is merely going to return the hidden Y attribute. Okay, and then we'll have the mutator set Y, which is going to simply update the hidden Y attribute. And then we'll override get area for rectangle. Okay, so what should this return? Well, what we want here is we want to return the value that's stored in X. Okay, and we want to take, grab that, and multiply it times what's inside of Y. Okay, now the, that hidden attribute Y is defined inside of class rectangle itself. Okay, so having you know a method defined in class rectangle itself directly access it, that's not that's not as big a deal because when it was initialized and when it gets set, well that's controlled by the methods that are provided by class rectangle itself. Right, so you don't have to worry about accidentally corrupting your data by just directly accessing it from within the class itself, right? Otherwise, it'd be kind of like, well, my set Y method, what, you know, I, 
Yeah, how am I supposed to directly access the hidden attribute if it, right? So uh, that, that hidden Y is already defined in class rectangle. Feel free to directly access it from within class rectangle. Um, but you could also, I mean, we could also have said get Y here too, but it doesn't matter, right? Because um, Y is defined inside of class rectangle itself. Okay, anyway, so let's create um, another object. This time it'll be a rectangle. And we'll in initialize it with, uh, I don't know, uh, two and three. Okay, and then we'll invoke the get area method for the rectangle object. Okay, and so which get area method is going to get invoked? The one it inherited from shape or the one that we added to class rectangle, the overridden version. Well, you already know, right? It's going to work just like with square. We're going to invoke the overridden version because the type of object is a rectangle. And so we used a reference to that object to invoke the getArray method. So that's the one that gets invoked. Now let's talk about that isInstance function, okay? To set up why this thing is useful, let me create a list of objects, right? A list of shapes. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll create a brand new shape object and I'll initialize it to two. I'll create a brand new square object and I'll initialize it with three. I'll create a brand new rectangle object and initialize it with um, three, four. Okay, so what this is, is this is a list of references to shape objects. Because a shape is a shape, a square is a shape, a rectangle is a shape. Okay, but it's also a list that contains a reference to a shape object, a reference to a square object, and a re reference to a rectangle object. Okay, so polymorphism is coming into play here as well in just a moment. So since that's a list, I can use a for loop to iterate over that list. So um, I'll do something like this, for s in shapes, okay? Because shapes is a list and lists are sequences and for loops can iterate over sequences. So if I have a print statement that looks something like this, What's happening is, is that for each iteration of the for loop, a ref the, the, the reference to that shape object is being assigned to S. And so then I'm invoking the get area method on this shape object. The next reference, a reference to square is being assigned to S. And so then I'm invoking the get area method on the square object and so on. You know, and likewise with the, with the rectangle object. So, Let's go ahead and run that. So you can see the last three numbers here, 0, 9, and 12. Well, 0 for shape, because remember the get area method for shape just returns 0. 9 for the square, because that returns x squared. And then 12 for rectangle, because that returns the x times the y. Okay. So it's another example of polymorphism because the program is determining which get area method should it execute. Well, it's a shape object, so we'll use the get area method defined in shape. Well, it's a square object, so we'll use the get area method that's defined in class square. Well, it's a rectangle object, so we'll use the get area method that's defined in class rectangle. Now let's throw a wrench into the works, right? Let's add a string to our list. Okay, now string doesn't have a get area method. So something bad's gonna happen when we try to invoke get area on that string. Blah. We have an exception that's raised, and the exception is attribute error. Right? That object, that string, has no attribute get area. Okay, so that's bad. So how can we make sure that we don't try to invoke a get area method on something that's not a shape. 
Well, that's where is instance comes in. Right? And so what we can do is, is we can create an if statement and the is instance function returns true or false. It's Boolean. Right? So this thing takes two arguments. And the first argument is a reference to an object. Okay, so in this case, you know, we're using S. And the second argument is the name of a class that you're trying to determine if that object is a type of. Right? So if is instance as shape. Well, every single one of these, the shape, square, rectangle, they is an instance of shape. They is a shape because of inheritance. Right? But high isn't. So is instance is going to return false for high, but true for everybody else. And so we'll only, because of that, we'll only invoke the Guderian method for things that are shapes. Okay, so now we only see the 0912, no exception raised, because when a reference to high was copied to S, this evaluated to false, no get area method was invoked for high. Okay, now, if that's freaking you out just a little bit, you know, let me, let me change this, let me show you something a little bit simpler. We'll decouple it, an example that's decoupled away from the loop. So I could do something like this. If is instance sh of shape, right? So remember line 40, we created a shape. Its reference was sh. Now this is going to be true because that object shape, which is assigned to sh, it is an instance of shape. So then we can print our get area value that's returned without any problem. So there's the zero, right? But if instead here, I put the high, right? Well, you're not gonna see anything because high is not an instance of shape, right? So that's how you can programmatically test to see if something is an instance of something before trying to use methods that would only belong to that something. So let's summarize what we talked about with regards to Python polymorphism. We talked about what it is and basically the ability for parent class, child class to have methods with the same name and for the program to be able to tell which method it should invoke based off of the type of object that's invoking the method. Gave you a definition for method overriding, providing a method in a child class that has the same name as a method in the parent class. And then I showed you how to use the isInstance function to determine if an object is an instance of a particular Okay, class. so that's gonna bring this video to a close. If you felt that the video was useful, please consider giving the video a thumbs up. And if you thought that the video sucked, well, then you've got that thumbs down button as an option as well. If you'd like to see more videos, if you're interested in more content from the channel, feel free to hit that subscribe button. And as usual, if you're a student of mine and you have further questions, feel free to drop me an email or to stop by my office hours. Okay, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.